Okay, hello everybody. So, um, I guess uh, I'm going to start off just by uh, kind of maybe setting the kind of expectations. What is this? Uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what, what should you expect from me in, in this presentation? Uh, to, to be honest, I don't want this to be a real formal thing. This isn't going to be like a... Um, like a Oh, sorry. This isn't going to be like a, uh, a documentary type movie or entertainment show. Uh, I'm going to be just telling you kind of about my life, my, my career from Kenyatta, or <coughs> my, uh, I guess my story, my path from Kenyatta to, to a career in engineering. Uh, I'm going to share tips with you, things that have helped me, um, my experiences, my experience in work, the kind of work that I've done and been exposed to. So I don't have a big formal presentation for you here, but um, with that said, uh, I will start with, with who am I? So, uh, I'm a local, from, uh, born and raised in the Bay Area here. Um, my parents, uh, right, you can set on the, the bio there, but uh, yeah, they're, they're both from, uh, my, my mom's from Texas. She came here when she was 18, and uh, she did her uh, bachelor's degree uh, in the area here. And my dad, he, he went to uh, Mexico. And uh, he, he lived, came from Mexico, he studied at the University of Guadalajara. So, um, yeah, both my parents, they met in San Francisco, and then they had me. And uh, I was uh, born and raised in uh, San Mateo County. I uh, lived in San Francisco for about eight years, in San Mateo mostly, uh, all my life, until uh, I went to uh, school in San Jose State. And I've pretty much been down in the South Bay ever since. So, that's kind of my whole background, um, but what, what, what really got me into engineering science a lot, was everybody here, are you all in uh, taking engineering science courses? No? Okay. So it's a background of uh, all types of degrees and paths, is that what the crowd is here? Okay. Alright, so what got me interested in, in science and technology, actually when I started off with, uh, with college, I, w I went to community college. Uh, and I started taking classes at Skyline, and I registered on the uh, like late registration, uh, the first day of the semester. I wasn't sure what I would do after high school. Uh, I wasn't even sure I'd go to college, but I had a friend who just kind of dragged me over there and said, go, you know, take some classes, get registered. So I, I registered and I started just kind of signed up, I'll do business. I, I didn't know why. I didn't know what that meant, but I figured if you're going to do school, you should do something that, that can get you a, a degree. So I started off with business, and uh, I wasn't super focused. I was kind of working on the side and uh, and taking classes and uh, just you know trying to figure things out where I'd go. And uh, eventually, I took enough courses to be ready to transfer with the, with the to get a degree in business. But I really didn't know what I would do, what what that meant. Um, you know, I thought just having a business degree, you work at a company, you sit down in office meetings, that, that sounded kind of boring. And I was like, what am I going to do with a business degree? So I really thought about, at, at that time, what was, uh, you know, what, what, what did I want to do in life? And, and that's kind of like, so I took a slow start because I spent a few years, you know, just floating around in community college. Um, so after a few years of that, I, I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do engineering. I always, I grew up, I, I worked on my dad, he was very hands-on, very technical, he liked to teach me how to do stuff, he would pick up a book, a uh, repairman, how, how do you fix this car, and, and he would learn how to fix it himself, and so he kind of taught me that. So, I've been very hands-on with things, and uh, I, I thought, I like, I like cars, I like mechanical stuff, I'll, I'll do mechanical engineering, so, um, that's what I, I went for that, and, uh, and then I started taking classes at, at Kenyatta, and uh, that's where I, I met Dr. E. So, well, that's it. Um, I'm really going to spend a lot of time on this slide, actually. Uh, most of the, most of my uh, story here, will, most of my presentation will be on this. But um, I'm going to kind of walk you through from Kenyatta, Skyline CSM, uh, where I went with this. So, uh, when I was taking classes at Kenyatta, uh, I, I think that that was a Really, one, one thing, actually, Dr. E, I gotta say, he, he really did help change my life here because I, I wasn't a great student, I wasn't super focused, but Dr. E will give you so much homework and 
and you, you you have to you have to do it, and it, it's over and over. But the, the thing was that he would stay after class and stay you know until ten at night and, and finish the homework with you that day. He's very very dedicated. So that that really just um, having somebody you know in your in your life who's uh, at school to support you like that is, is something that I, I really needed, uh, and that's that really helped me. Uh, you know, get really into into school. I think I went from you know getting kind of like B's and C's, doing business classes to, to I, I think my last two semesters here, where I was just taking nothing but engineering courses. I had a 4.0, wow. um, just those those two semesters. But I uh, I remember you know, so I got really really into the um, engineering, and I got really um, comfortable with with talking to my professors. I would go after school, after hours, and just all, all of my professors. I, I took other classes at, at uh, Skyline and CSM, but I was, uh, you know, very, very much turned around as a, as a, you know, really focused student. And um, I think part of that is, is you spend a few years before that working uh, kind of part-time and doing school part-time and not really focused. And, and then uh, eventually I came to, okay, now, now I'm going to focus. What do I want to do in life? So that was part of it as well, but uh, definitely having a professor like Dr. E is a, a really great thing to have. So he is, uh, uh, for, for those of you who are taking classes with him, uh, you're, you're really, really lucky because uh, you're not going to find anybody like that uh, again. So actually, and it kind of goes, I, I would apply that to the whole community college uh, system. Um, because after, after leaving Kenyatta, so I went to San Jose State, state local. I tried initially to commute. Um, from, my parents were living, I was living with them in uh, Pacifica at the time, and it was a pretty hard commute, so I ended up getting a roommate and just moving down to San Jose, but my initial intentions were, were just to stay very local. But um, anyway, after I went to San Jose State, a big, big kind of, um, I guess, culture shock or, or difference is that you go to your class and then, uh, the professor teaches, does the instructions, and then um, you get out of class and you have questions. And you go to their office hours, but their office hours are only you know, a few hours a week, uh, so there's time slots where they're available. But you go there and there might be five students in line. And so you wait in line and there's like, you know, they, they take up 20, 40, 50 minutes, and then you have like five or 10 minutes to talk to them. And so I got kind of frustrated with that after trying and trying for a couple months. It was kind of just a big adjustment. And, and he, I kind of realized that you're, you're more, um, not on your own, but uh, you definitely have a lot less support from the, the faculty and instructors. And you really have to uh, spend a lot more time uh, uh, working with, with friends and, and studying. So that was a big adjustment. Because the other thing there is that uh, they also give less homework. And so uh, I have a, had a lot less homework, and um, I would basically spend a lot more time just, you know, you do the, the homework that they give you, but then you kind of slack off, and then a test comes up, and then you cram all night. So my, my schedule was chaotic, kind of with, uh, you know, some, some weeks you're just cramming all night, and then uh, others you're a little bit more stable, and then cram all night. and. Uh, so, um, but definitely what, what helped me survive all of that was, was having uh, students, uh, fellow students in, in school. Um, that's that's a really, really what, 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 what will help you, uh, I guess not survive, you'll survive, you'll get through it, but uh, it'll definitely help you succeed. Um, I, I think we had a, uh, like a college uh, a club room, um, at San Jose State for uh, the mechanical engineering divisions, they have different groups, and so ASME, um, they had an ASME club room, uh, Association of Mechanical, or American Association of Mechanical Engineers, it's been a while. Uh, but I was, uh, so we would study in that club room, we had some couches and stuff, and they even had ping pong tables, some people would take breaks, but uh, yeah, we, we would study and sometimes even end up sleeping on those couches and, and going to school the next day or in the morning waking up to take a uh, test. But uh, those, that's where groups of us would get together and, and do the homework and, and really work together because you, you don't have the same time there you have uh, with, with professors. 
Um, so you really have to rely on the, <clears throat> the help of your, your fellow students. Um, so San Jose State was, was pretty good. Uh, I, I, I definitely think, oh, you know, that you, you guys are all in, in the right place uh, right now because I, I did notice that, that, and you know, I'm not here because I'm here and I, I want to talk about the community and college and say it's great because I'm here visiting it. I, I'm, I'm saying it out, out of the, the um, truth, I mean, the, uh, really the, the sincereness of my heart. I, I think the community college is, is a much better place to start off because well, I know when I went to San Jose State, the first uh, few classes where I was taking you know, fluid mechanics and, and classes like that, I had all of the foundation of, of the first two years of engineering really under my belt. And that's from doing all of those homework problems that Dr. E gave you. I mean, the, the number of problems you, you do over and over, it really embeds it in, into you. And that's something that I noticed after transferring there that the other students didn't have. Um, in fact, there was one day I was working on a project after hours with a group of students, and um, we, we just, I don't, that, I don't know how we, we ended up getting together like for a few weeks working on a project, but, but we were all the better students in the class. Um, I, I would say the top students in that class. And we started talking and, and asking each other where, what our background was, and we all came from a community college. Uh, and we all you know, had a better understanding of the material and classwork. So, I really do think that the community college um, prepares you a, a lot better. So even if, if you don't know it or not, uh, I'm telling you, I, I think you guys are, are making the right decision. So good for you there. Plus you're saving money. Um, the downside, you know, not everything's positive. I mean, there are pros and cons to everything. So the, the, the downside of being in a community college is, is maybe you're missing out on some of your uh, fun years, you could say, like the you know, four-year college, I, I definitely would say, I had a lot more fun in terms of just hanging out with kids, your freedom, your, your, you know, you're away from home, away from your parents, and, and very more, much more independent. Um, so I had a lot more like just kind of growing up, having fun, excitement there that I felt like I would have enjoyed more if I was there, you know, in a four-year college the whole time. But uh, looking back, I, I definitely wouldn't trade that for the the education um, that you get here. But uh, even then, San Jose, it's, a, it's a kind of a commuter college type college. It's not, I mean, there, there are people who live on campus, they're dorms, but a lot of them disappear on the weekends. Uh, so it's not like a community college where, you know, people, this really is a commuter, commuter school. But um, San Jose isn't like, um, maybe UCLA has a lot more students that live, live on campus. And there's a lot more activities going on and stuff, but San Jose still does have, you know, all the fraternities and, and uh, student clubs and student works. So <coughs> at San Jose um, State, some some things that helped me. Uh, I got involved with the uh, I, actually even here at um, at Kenyatta, I got involved with the um, uh, Mesa Engineering Program, uh, math. Uh, Engineering Science uh, Achievement, is that correct? Uh, so that that program really really helps. It's an after school program. It's um, kind of like a nonprofit uh, program to I think state funded mostly to help students get involved, get into math, science, and engineering. So they they kind of host um, events like uh, like tours of of companies and, and facilities. Uh, they'll, they'll have a club room and, and uh, offer tutoring and things like that. So that, that definitely helped me out there, and that helped me out in San Jose. And um, there, there was the same thing, uh, the program they have there. So uh, that was a, a good program to be involved in. And also, uh, just the student clubs. I, I highly recommend that if you transfer, go to a four-year university, you get involved in a student organization. Uh, there's, you, you can even create your own student organization. If, you know, there's a lot of national organizations and, and there might be one that you want to be a part of, but they don't have a local chapter. Or you can start one and, and you know, declare yourself the president and assign a vice president and you know, it can grow from there. But uh, I, I definitely, definitely recommend um, 
getting involved like that. So that, that's something I did, and I, I made a lot of friends from that, and I still have friends that I, I hang out with on the weekends, and, and that you know I, I know from those times uh, at school. But it's it's not just that; it's about networking. Um, I, I definitely the more people you meet, the more friends you make in, in school, the more it's going to help you in 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 life because. Uh, you know, especially now with social networking, it's easy to keep in, in touch with people. Um, but some of the things that, that really, really I would say, like most important things for getting into a career from school, it, it's, it's who you know, knowing somebody, knowing friends, um, knowing, knowing people at companies. That, that's, that's, I mean, you have lots and lots of competition in terms of people are all getting out of school, they don't have work experience, maybe, maybe people have internships, so that gets you a step ahead of somebody without an internship. But there's a lot of people, so they look at your GPA, and then kind of just your personality when they interview you. You know, if, if I'm interviewing somebody that's a new college graduate, um, I, I see their GPA and I, I just assume they know the material, so I, I don't really care about asking them technical questions too much about it, how much they understand. It, it, it comes more like personality questions. Can I work with this person? Uh, that, that sort of thing. So, But what really, really helps is if you have somebody who can recommend you. Because for a company hiring somebody, they're, they're taking a big risk. They're, they're bringing this person on, they're giving them a contract, okay, you're part of the company, and then Sometimes it doesn't work out, but it's it's so it's it's much 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 better if you can get a recommendation that just puts you way ahead. So, with that said, I've I've had um, just from school I've had lots of friends, and, and I think all of well my my two really I've worked at so Intuitive Surgical and Applied Materials those two companies, but uh, both of those jobs that I got into was because of people I know, uh, people I worked with in school. So definitely uh, networking. That's, a, that's one of the most important, valuable things you can do for your career while you're in school. And, and not just you know, networking, you, you make friends with a buddy, you go out and have a beer on the weekend, once you're over 21. But uh, I, I mean, really good, good, like, good friends, uh, as far as good, good people, um, people who perform well in school. You might work on a project together. And, and you might do a good job on that project. And, and they'll remember that. Maybe two years later, they'll, they'll see that uh, you're looking for a, a new job, or they might just think of who, who can we uh, bring on this company. And they might think, oh, I remember John. He, I worked on a project with him. He was a really good student. Uh, and then there you go. You get an email, and somebody says, do you want to come over here? So I, I've actually had to, you know, I, I mean, I went to, after school, I worked at, at Intuitive Surgical. But uh, I, at the time, I had uh, several friends asking me if I wanted to go to PGA, if I wanted to go to Boeing. So, and, and those were all people from school, and they, they just got into jobs ahead of me. And so, that, that's really having that pool is really good. So, I graduated from San Jose in 2008, and uh, the economy was pretty much going downhill at that time, the Great Recession. And then uh, 2009. <coughs> So I worked at Intuitive Surgical for about a year, and uh, Intuitive Surgical is uh, actually that's a really cool company. Uh, uh, I sometimes it, I even think of going back there, but they make a robotic robotic surgical system. So the doctor sits at a console, puts their their uh, fingers in these manipulators, these, their hands, and uh, they uh, they look inside these uh, two cameras. They're separate separate cameras, so they get 3D depth perception from the cameras, uh, which is a, a huge deal because when you have a 2D screen, you really have no depth perception. And so they'll do surgery inside of people inside of um, the torso area, area mostly. But if you're going in there and you see organs and you're hitting them and poking them, you kind of go until you hit something and poke something because you you really can't see the depth perception. So that machine, the main product that Intuitive Surgical makes, uh, really, really changes uh, lives because it, it's, it, they have the 3D depth perception and it's pretty much like there's a robot going inside of you with little tiny arms and, and it's a doctor kind of doing it like virtual reality, going in and grabbing stuff and cutting off you know, a tumor or whatever and sewing you back up. 
So that was a pretty fun experience. I got to play around with those machines a lot. Uh, I was a quality in the, the kind of in the end of the manufacturing line, uh, quality uh, uh, quality assurance engineer. So um, with that job, the skills you kind of pick up, uh, manufacturing, you, you learn about the, the process of, of a, what, how a company goes through the steps of manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing was not really, you know, when I, when I was in San Jose State, I wanted to do, do uh, R&D, like uh, latest and greatest, newest modeling, drafting, designing new things. And manufacturing didn't really seem as much of an interesting thing to me. It's like you build something and build something over and over and over. Now, I actually, that I'm at this point in my career, I, I'm, I'm beginning to value that a lot more and realize the, the importance of manufacturing. Um, you can, you can come up with a good idea and, uh, and make something, but to manufacture it repeatedly over and over and over, it takes a lot more people to, to be involved in that side uh, of, of the, the process. Um, and it, so that's something that I think there's a lot of uh, just, I guess, a lot of skills uh, and knowledge you can carry over that, that from one company to another, and it can be manufacturing a completely different product, like going from a, um, a biomedical device company to a semiconductor company. Uh, but, but still, a lot of the same types of uh, disciplines they use in the manufacturing floor, the processes they go through, even the language they speak, terminology, uh, that that's all flows across. So anyway, I, uh, I did work in Intuitive for a year, and uh, I had a lot of fun with that. But uh, that was about 2009. And I was saving up money while I was working there. And I, I was thinking, you know, 2009, the economy was tanked and the uh, houses were dropping in value. And uh, I've always just wanted to buy a house, not, not really to be, to, to live in a house or own a house, but really just to not pay rent. I, I don't know why that's even today that kind of bothers me, the idea of, of paying rent and that you're just throwing money out the window. So I wanted my own house just for a financial type of investment. And it was, uh, it was a time when houses were becoming affordable for me, so I thought, oh, I can buy a house now. And, uh, but then I thought about it again. If I bought a house, I would be married to this house, really, married to a mortgage, locked in. And, and I felt too young to do that to myself, to be stuck with, a, with where I'm really like stuck. I, I, I like the idea of being free, where I could get up and take a job in New York or, or you know, move anywhere. So, uh, what I what I started thinking about was I, I didn't get what I, what I wanted to do after school was um, take a vacation like a long vacation go to Europe do something like that but I, I just started working right away so I thought you know with the, with this money I had saved up I could go to Latin America for a few months and I just quit my job and go there and then I thought about it. I could go there for like a year and if I wanted to it's it's cheap enough if I lived in hostels and backpacking so. Once I got that thought in my mind, um, I, I, I decided that's what I was going to do. So I ended up quitting my job in 2009, and I, I remember that that's when I had friends who were unemployed, they couldn't find work, um, they've been looking for jobs for a long time, they get people graduating from school, it, it was a tough time in the economy. And I had a friend, she was almost crying, telling me I'm crazy, because I was leaving a job and, and going in and doing that. But um, you know, uh, it was something I wanted to do, and uh, so I, I just said, you, know, you gotta enjoy life while, while you're young. So th this is actually a, just kind of a, a word of advice I'll, I'll give to all of you. Um, don't, don't pass up opportunities, especially while you're young. There's a lot of things that you can do in life, but I, I think for me, um, traveling around on that trip, uh, was was one of the greatest things for, for my own just personal development. You really learn a lot about yourself. So I took off. I bought a one-way ticket to Guatemala. Um, and uh, the reason I, I've been to Mexico a lot. My dad's from Mexico, but uh, Guatemala. My my Spanish was really bad. I took some. My dad. Shame on him. He he never taught me Spanish. Um, so uh, I, I, that's one thing, you know, being half, I know I don't look half Mexican, but I'm half Mexican, and, and not knowing how to speak Spanish when that's my, my dad's first language, it, it always kind of bugged me. So 
Uh, Guatemala has really cheap uh, Spanish schools and, and uh, a lot of them really good. So that's kind of why I chose that. I went there, I, I took one-on-one -on -one lessons with uh, different tutors and I found one that was like $3 an hour, $3.50 an hour for a one-on-one -on -one lesson. So I did like 20 hours a week and uh, then just, you know, live, live life in the lagoons and stuff like that. So it was, it was a pretty fun time. And I ended up just traveling all over Latin America. I got to Colombia. Fell in love with Colombia. Colombia is an awesome, awesome place. I was going to spend one month there. I ended up staying there three months until my visa was going to expire. And, uh, and then I was going to move on. And um, I had a friend who emailed me and said, John, you've been away too long. So now it's 2010. Uh, the economy is starting to come back. These companies like Applied Materials that had hiring freezes for the last year or so, uh, they're, they're starting to open up uh, job requisitions and, and hire people again. So my friend emailed me, said, John, come back, you know, give me your resume. I, I can get you a job here, there's an opening. And I actually didn't want to come back, but you know, I thought I'd been gone nine months. It might be hard to, to explain that to somebody um, when, when I try to get a job later on. So uh, it'd be good if I can just get a job now. So I, I said, I, you know, I don't want to come back unless uh, you think there's a good chance I can get the job. So he said, yes, so I'll, I'll get you in. So I came back and I, I got a job there. So it, it all worked out. And uh, I've pretty much been at Applied ever since. So going from yeah, Kenyatta to Applied, uh, how am I on time? We have, I'll turn off my phone. Time. You know, how, how much time? I'm just wondering how much time I have for the. Okay, good. So, yeah, go, going from Kenyatta to apply. That's that's kind of an overview of my whole my whole story. But um, I will say just to to go back and touch on, on the things that, that I think are important. Um, Kenyatta uh, Community College, definitely the, the the time you put into the the homework you do. The, Everything you, you do in school, it actually comes back. It, it pays pays off. Uh, you'll be surprised. Like the the thing is, now that I'm an engineer, I don't remember. I, I'm sure I would fail pretty much every exam that, that's given to me uh, for for heat transfer, you know, mechanical dynamics. Uh, probably not algebra, but maybe some of the uh, differential equations, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I would bomb all of these tests right now. But the, the thing is, I, I've maybe forgotten how to do, or, or can't, you know, I'm not rusty on all of the, the math and all of that, but I, I remember just the, the basic um, fundamentals of everything. And, and I remember, you know, what, what you can do. I, I know in physics you can calculate exactly where, if I throw a ball over there at this force and this angle, exactly where it should land. And, Things like that, and, and you know the fundamentals behind everything. And I know where the references are to go back and, and look that stuff up if I need to. So I do come across problems where I've, you know, th thermal, thermal um, dynamics issues, and, and I know, <coughs> I remember from school what you're able to calculate. I might not remember exactly how to do it, but I know where to go and find the, the references on where to get the information. So the, the time that I spent, though, doing that in school, it really, really helps you later on in life just with, I think, everything you do. Um, you, you, you don't see it directly, but even the stuff like uh, English, literature, that, that's something I was less interested in now, but now that I'm, I'm further on in my career, I'm more interested in, in how to uh, speak, uh, you know, clearly and, and eloquently and use better words, uh, you know, better vocabulary and language. I, I see uh, people who are CEOs and, and you know, the, the people who are running companies and, and one thing they all have in common is they're very good public speakers and, and they're very good with language and, and also um, most of the time I see these people, they, they're really uh, just their memory is very sharp, like they'll meet you and uh, you tell them their name and then talk to them for a while and they'll still remember your name like 30 minutes later. And just like, I have a hard time when I meet 10 new people, which person is which? And, and I, I notice that people like that, they really have, this, there's something there that's, that's sharp. But those are a lot of skills you, you'll gain, um, like 
English literature. Uh, just when you're when you're in school, and those might be things that you don't you kind of take for granted. Like, why am I here? I just want a degree so I can get a job. But really, the the looking back, uh, I I value that much more now that I've been in in the the work world. I uh, I didn't value it as much when I was in your shoes here, but now where I'm at, now that it, where I, I am where I am, uh, I I kind of wish I even you know spent more time. Um, just on, on the other the things I study, the business. Um, I, I do plan actually on going back and getting an MBA one day, but uh, I've been saying that for a while. Um, okay, so applied materials. So I, I guess what I, I want to do, I want to tell you guys or teach you guys some stuff about you know what I do uh, today. I, I think I could probably talk about applied all day. Um, because it's kind of live and breathe that these days, but uh, Applied Materials is a company that makes uh, machines that make microchips. So this is, we're in Silicon Valley, it's the semiconductor industry. Semiconductors are, are you know, materials that, that, uh, that conduct electricity, but uh, not necessarily always conductive. Um, so you're, you're basically, uh, the, the, uh, the products that Applied Materials makes are machines that make microchips. And um, we don't actually make microchips uh, and sell them. Companies like Intel and Samsung, they, they have huge factories and, and they make microchips. They design chips, so they, they have the circuits and um, chip design uh, engineers and everything like that. And, and the manufacturing, that's back, back to manufacturing. Um, it's just that the, the chip, the R&D teams that, that do the design are, are, you know, one part of the company, but the manufacturing is just huge because it, you, you need to be able to, the, the number of people involved in manufacturing, you, you need to be able to sell these things and make a profit at the end of the day, the new designs. So, uh, things like this, this is a, um, uh, basically a patterned wafer. It starts off as a bare uh, silicone, silicon, excuse me, um, just a bare silicon uh, piece of material, disc, wafer. And then this goes from one machine to another and gets uh, processed, it goes through different processes. So all these different machines, I'm going to pass this around if you want to take a look, try not to break it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you guys want to see that at the end, you can come up and check it out. But Basically, these wafers, they go from one machine to another, and they go through different processes. So the processes might be um, adding on material, where they do deposition. So they're depositing films and materials. It, it could be uh, doing lithography, where they're, they're drawing etching lines, kind of like with the traces on where the, uh, the electricity goes. And, um, or it could be etching, where you're removing material. So. Uh, a lot of this, you're, you're making the microchips, and these things are down in the nanoscale. I mean, if you look, if you think about it today, it's it's just pretty mind-boggling. The, the number of uh, a transistor is basically a switch, on, off, left, right, and all the ones and zeros that computers work off of. That's all transistors, open, close, and um, basically the, these things have billions of transistors in, in just a small, small space. You, you, can't, you can't even see them, they're so small. So now we're down at the uh, nanoscale and uh, atomic uh, level where you're producing uh, microchips for full production and you have to you know, make things that are the size of just several atoms wide for a transistor. And, uh, and they're doing it. And, uh, but it, it's, it's, there's a lot of challenges involved to be able to do that on a production scale. So uh, we make machines that, that make microchips, so we have to be able to support our, our customers like Intel, Samsung, these guys who, who buy these machines and fill up their fa factories. Uh, they're called fabs. So fabs are, are uh, basically semiconductor fabrication uh, plants. And uh, they fill up these huge factories. I mean, they're just... I, I've been in a bunch of them. Uh, actually, I used to support a, a lot of the customers, uh, and they're they're just so big you can't even see the end of it when you're inside. And these big white rooms, uh, 
It'll look like this. This is actually a picture of our manufacturing floor in uh, Austin, uh, where they're making and putting the machines together. But the um, so the, the sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, so back to the, the microchips. So the, the, these these go through different machines, uh, and it, each machine ha has to do a different task. So I, I worked with uh, Etch when I started, and that's where you're just removing materials. Um, but the, it's it's just pretty amazing how many steps for that that wafer that's that's going around. How many machines it has to go through. It, it literally goes through maybe a, a couple thousand different steps. It, several. Several hundred to several thousand, depending on the com complexity of the microchip. Uh, but it will go through one machine to another. These are usually pumped down, vacuum chambers, uh, sealed. They have toxic gases going through, electrical power, uh, and your plasma inside, and you're, you're bombarding the wafer with, with uh, electrons, photons, and um, hitting it with, with ions. So there's a lot of chemistry involved. There's a mechanical engineering, thermal dynamics. There's a electronics for the whole machine. There's a, so you have software engineers controlling it. Uh, a lot of different engineers, a, a lot of different people. Um, so my time there, uh, I spent, like I said, I started off in Edge as a product support engineer. And, there, I started in um, kind of working in the lab is just kind of uh, getting to, to know the, the, the products and, and what we do and the, the you know, issues. So it's kind of like started off as a, just a lab, uh, lab grunt, just working in the lab all the time, just playing around with the, with the chambers, fixing them uh, so we could run wafers for our, our customers to show them the, what the capability was. and. Uh, after a little while of that, I started getting involved in uh, more like R&D projects. So this is where I wanted to start off, you know, after school, and I, and I got there. And so the the R&D side was pretty fun. You you, you design something new, you work with new products. So I, I worked with um, uh, like mechanical, electrical, uh, software, uh, all these different engineers, and uh, we would we would. Come up with a new, basically a new chamber, new etch chamber, and I, I was really kind of figuring out how the whole thing went together, and uh, I, I had to support the whole product. So I would uh, work in the lab on this thing just a, a lot, and um, figure out how you know it's all new hardware, how to get the hardware to talk to each other. There was a lot of issues we'd go through. So now there, there were different engineers responsible for different. Um, basically categories uh, of, of hardware, but uh, I was kind of connecting all the dots, so there I, I really became like a system expert for this etch chamber, and I uh, got to know the whole thing, how, to, how it works. Uh, if it, it, so with etching, you're basically removing material, but you have to do it selectively. Uh, selectively means that you're just <coughs> removing a certain type of material without removing other materials. So they, they do that with uh, the chemicals and gases. Basically, you get uh, plasma, and you bombard this wafer with that plasma. And uh, so these, these photons just hammer away and remove material. But it's the, the chemistries involved that it will select which materials get removed and which don't. But while you're doing that, you're digging trenches into the wafer. And these trenches, the shapes of them, they need to be uniform, straight, and we, we try to make them, uh, well it depends, but you, the, the newest and latest technologies, we're always trying to speed up the manufacturing process, so we make uh, deeper trenches, but the deeper you get, the harder it is to maintain a, a nice profile. And you're trying to do this across the whole wafer, so keep it uniform, and, and also do it repeatedly on what wafer after wafer after wafer. So. I got to play with these machines and work with them and we, we would run wafers through and we would see that on the edge we're tilting and so we'd have to come up with a new uh, edge ring actually right here. So this is a, a ring that, that goes on the outside of the wafer and I'll pass this around too. Um, it's made of a ceramic material. But 
It'll be things like that where now we have a challenge because at the edge of the wafer is is uh, always uh, tilted in on the, the process results. So then we have to figure out how to fix that and, and we'll come up with ideas uh, on making the, the edge more of a heat sink or uh, more conductive or, or an insulator, uh, different, different things like that. So I got to play around with the, the chamber for a while and it was in the R&D phase for about a year. After about a year, we started shipping the first uh, chambers to our customer sites. So what happened is our customers would give us wafers like uh, the one floating around and they would say, we need to etch this and uh, what can you guys do? We want to see you know, your latest and greatest of hardware. We say, we have a, a machine we think that can etch that good for you. So you know, we'll, we'll put it in our chamber, run it through, do, do a demonstration, give it back to them, they'll look at it. And then they'll get uh, more interested. They might come to our site and uh, run some wafers of theirs that they bring with us. And, and then if they're really interested, they'll say, we want to uh, evaluate this, this product. <laughs> Now these, these are big deals because uh, those big, big fabs, they'll decide for their future production, um, their future, like the next generation of iPhone or, or you know, what, whatever, they're always going to the next generation product. And to get there, to get to these uh, tinier and tinier transistors, they always need newer, latest, greatest equipment. So um, we're always trying to fill up the fabs with, with our tools, but it, these, these, uh, these opportunities to sell a bunch of these tools come once in a while. So if you can win that business, then they'll buy a bunch of your tools, fill up their fab, and, and you want that node. And then it's on to the next, uh, basically, competition. You know, they're always looking in the future, always trying to gain new business. So the wheels keep turning, and uh, that, that's kind of the, the, the name of the game here. But, um, so while I was in Edge, uh, yeah, I, I started going to the field with this chamber and uh, our first customer installations, I would go along with the chamber, we'd install it, I knew how to set up the whole thing and train the local, we have local customer uh, uh, account teams, um, so we have a local office with the support team at all of our, our customer sites, and so the like, local customer engineers and train them, and then um, basically travel back and forth and go to our, back to, over here we call it Santa Clara, uh, that's like our headquarters, back to Santa Clara, be in the lab again, um, still, you know, figuring things out because it's not a final product, it's a beta, beta product. And we're still making progress. As, after a while, this, this product evolved and uh, we got more, going to more different customer sites all around the world, so I started going to different countries, uh, different places, uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, Japan, Japan's nice, I like Japan. But uh, we, we basically, after a while, this, this product starts shipping and then it starts selling and, and, then, uh, and then it becomes a production product. And then, uh, and then we start having field issues and then I start having to go to travel. So I, I traveled quite a bit uh, once it became a, a production uh, product and then after some time, it, it, you know, the issues are ironed out and it's kind of back to the lab to do the whole thing over again, you know, back in the R&D phase and everything like that. So that whole process was about four and a half years um, that I was in Edge and I kind of went through that whole the product life cycle, we call it. Uh, so uh, after that, I wanted to do something different. Um, I wanted something that didn't require as much travel. I got kind of tired of the travel at the end. So I, I went to another group uh, where I became, uh, well, we had a mechanical engineering title. Uh, and I worked just with basically, uh, you know, modeling parts, doing drawings, uh, GDT, CAD, um, working with specs. Specs are very important. You have to, uh, it, you basically, you can give something to a company and have them build it for you, but there's a lot of things, details that we find later, like that might affect how the wafer performs, and maybe we didn't specify it. Uh, it could be the resistivity of the material. We put a spec that was kind of loose, and we find out later it needs to be tighter. Uh, so, anyway, work a lot with specs. That's where I spent a lot of my time um, on specifications. Um, and then materials. So we have a lot of like materials engineers, but 
They're, they're selecting materials like this ring that's getting passed around. That's made of uh, silicon carbide. So there's, there's a lot of these different materials that, that we use in the chamber for their material properties. Maybe um, they're, they can withstand uh, plasma uh, attacks or chemical uh, attacks that are not corro uh, easily corroded. Um, they're very resistant to other uh, um, excuse me, chemicals. and So anyway, ceramics is, is something, uh, materials selection is something I've been learning a lot of uh, while in, in this current role. And then suppliers, working with our suppliers. I, I used to go to customers and visit our customers. Now I'm on the other end where I'm the customer and I'm, I'm working with suppliers. So uh, actually the, the other day uh, I've been having a lot of supplier meetings. Um, so Let's see, and then manufacturing development, you know, working with suppliers. So that, that's really kind of my career, they, uh, what I've gone through um, from Kenyatta to Applied Materials, where I'm at now, where I just came from. Um, but I guess I, I want to wrap this up uh, and maybe take some questions, uh, closing thoughts. So does anybody have any questions for me? What's your plan for the next five to ten years? Good question. Um, so, you know, five to ten, uh, so ten, I don't have a ten year plan yet. But yeah, five years, I, I definitely want to move ahead in my career. So, I, I want to move to a director, is really the, you know, my, my goal. And how do I get there? Uh, I'm a manager now, but uh, director is like the next step up. So. That's really my, my five-year goal, is moving, moving up the ladder. Uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. So the question is, do employers care about uh, what school you, you went to? Um, this, to be honest, it, it some, I, I think it's a personal thing. Some people might care. I think in this area with uh, San Jose State, San Jose State's well known in this area. So like a lot of the VPs and stuff at my company and, and uh, other companies I work with, they're, they're from San Jose State. Which worldwide, San Jose State's not a well known school. You have Stanford and Berkeley, which are two of the top schools in the world, really. Universities in the world for, for master's programs. Um, but, you know, I, I think like for me, if I see somebody who's from Stanford and I see somebody who's from San Jose State, uh, maybe I'm biased because I'm from San Jose State, but, but I mean, being perfectly honest, I, I don't really look at that differently uh, if it's a bachelor's degree. Master's degree, I think it's probably more important in, in PhD, which school you go to, but for, for me, as hiring somebody, you know, personally, I, I don't make a big difference, and I think most of the people at my company don't, don't make a big difference out of which school. It's really more important, you know, the, the kind of personality you, you get, the energy you, you see in that person. That, that will tell me a, a lot more than, than uh, what school they went to um, for a bachelor's. Any other questions? Yes? How often do engineers travel? Uh, you know, uh, that's a big, uh, there, there could be basically zero to 95% travel. Uh, it depends on the, the job, but yeah, I, I do know some engineers, mechanical engineers that have never traveled anywhere, and I know some guys who are just road warriors, they're on the road all the time. So the travel, travel really depends on which, which group you get into. Any other questions? So that's a good question. The question is, what have I been doing to improve my communication skills to, to do better in my career, climb the corporate ladder? So, um, actually, not not much. That's not something I've been focused on. But I will say that that one of you know I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, one of the most valuable classes to me uh, that I took was uh, a communication class at uh, College of San Mateo. Uh, it's it's a skill being able to communicate in front of people, and I'm not 
I'm not standing up here by any means saying I'm a great pre presenter, but I I'm much better than I was when I was a student here. You know, and it it's one thing is developing that over the years. I guess you, you get going to meetings. I'll, I'll present meetings to. Uh, some big people, I've never presented to our CEO, but the, the vice presidents, general managers below the CEO sometimes, they're, they're, I'm presenting to them and, and big groups of executives. So I think to be able to do that, you, you definitely, um, definitely like things like if you've ever heard of Toastmasters, it's, uh, you know, you give a toast, uh, but there's an organization called Toastmasters, as I think it's a national organization or maybe even worldwide. But uh, it's just kind of, you know, groups of people who get together and they practice giving speeches. And that's something that that's, uh, I think is really, really valuable. And they actually have a group at my company who does that. They, they meet like every Wednesday or something. And I still haven't been to their, their meeting, but it's on like my to-do list. It's just, uh, it's easy to get busy at work and, and just get stuck doing your job. But uh, yeah, that's that's something I definitely plan on getting more involved with and, and doing is, is uh, attending the Toastmaster uh, sessions to, to improve my speech skills. And, and I definitely do think that can help you move further in your career. Uh, I'll say that there's a, there's a lot of smart people uh, in my company and I'll see that I actually, the, the people who get promoted are not necessarily the smartest, best engineers. It's the people who speak up, the squeaky wheel, the people who are vocal and opinionated and share their opinion. Uh, the louder ones seem to move up the ladder more. The, the guys who are really smart, really brilliant, know how to do a good job. They, even managing a small team of people, they, they can get their team to invent great products and things. The, the, they'll they'll be valued, uh, but they, they don't seem to move up to become VPs right away. It's it's usually the loud guys. So <laughs> that's that's something that uh, the CLI. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. Let's give him a round of applause.